Hello, and thanks for checking out this week's webisode. I'm Jeff Phillips, and today I have Ben here, and we're going to be discussing uh, mental health care in the U.S. So, Ben, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And if you don't mind uh, sharing with the viewers what it is that you do. Uh, my name is Ben McGraw. I am the president and CEO of McGraw Systems, and at McGraw Systems, we provide information technology to those that are servicing in the, those in the mental health care field. Okay. Now, with all the talk in the media today about the state of, of healthcare in the U.S., you know, mental illness is not really talked about all that much. Can you explain the current state of uh, mental health care and mental illness in the U.S.? Yeah, well, Jeff, it's a pretty serious topic. I mean, if you look at the numbers, um, depression actually is like the third um, largest disease burden, according to the World Health Organization, actually worldwide. So that's a huge um, number there. And if you look at what the Centers for Disease Control has come out with, one in two uh, people in the United States, or one in 10 people in the United States have actually, are suffering from depression currently today. Um, and actually 6.7% of the U.S. adults are suffering from major depression. And so if you look at uh, really what that is, it's uh, essentially about two weeks period where a person is essentially debilitated as a result of that. So it takes a huge uh, toll on their uh, personal life um, and also on their work life, and it's really tough. And then one of the other ones that's a big um, uh, mental illnesses that's really tough is bipolar disorder. It's a very elusive disorder. It's very hard to diagnose and it's typically not diagnosed until a very late age. And that one is, it takes a tremendous uh, toll on the economy at around $45 billion a year. And for each um, episode, if a person is to have a manic episode, uh, it's about $11,000 in hospital costs. And if the person cannot get um, diagnosed and treated, you're looking at a lifetime cost of about $650,000 wow. uh, for, uh, for one person in their entire life. I think the other aspect of all this, so that's kind of talking um, about uh, the, disease, the, disease, the disease prevalence right now, but also um, there's a lot of issues right now with uh, managed care and uh, government funding that we see. Um, and simply on the, the managed care side is that the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists that are out there, they're being pressured to see more and more patients because you know, they're essentially not getting paid as much. So to see, be paid the same amount that they were in the past, they're just having to fill their schedules. And so the amount of time that they're able to spend with the patient is being drastically reduced. And so that's where we fit in to help with information technology to be able to help with that. And then on the government side and also on the managed care side, one of the major, major issues is just simply lack of bed space. And we're sitting here in North Carolina here in Pittsburgh and we're talking about you know managed care and we're talking about government funding and all that. And there was a very, very famous um, example in the media just recently, um, and that's uh, from the Dorothea Dix Hospital in Raleigh. And Dorothea Dix was very, very famous in helping people with mental illness in the past, and um, she's got a monument in her name uh, up in Boston, um, you know, given what she's done uh, for the, the field. But that hospital in Raleigh was actually shut down. And uh, people that were in the, the hospital, uh, they were actually moved out to the Central Regional Hospital in Butler. And then there's this big hubbub around that because there were not enough beds in Butler. And luckily, the University of North Carolina came in and kicked in about $40 million to really help to alleviate the situation. But it's a little example of how government funding is not really helping out. And also managed care is just really drastically reducing the, um, you know, the amount of money that's available for this as well. And I think the, the other aspect, too, is, is medication, too. I think the, the doctors are really flying blind. Um, I, I think also the number of um, you know clinical trials the basic core research in R&D is, is really shifted and you know to be honest with you I really blame the FDA and when I say that I really blame not only the FDA but really just the government as well the government is really not enabling the FDA to do their job and helping get these drugs out to market faster and so if you look at a typical clinical trial process you're looking at 12 to 15 years and you know upwards of two billion dollars to you know, depending on if you take into factors 
all the drugs that have failed in the entire clinical process for some of these pharmaceutical companies, you're looking at $20 billion to get some of these drugs to market. And um, that's really unfair to the pharmaceutical company. And I think the FDA needs to relax its standards and be able to get some of these drugs out to market faster because a lot of these patients have comorbid conditions. They're taking other medications at the same time. And so you want to be able to not test the drugs in a vacuum, but really test the drugs in a market in the real world where patients are actually suffering from these various different disorders, taking all these different drugs at the same time and dealing with various different comorbid conditions. And honestly, I don't really think that we in, in the medical community really understand the human mind. I think it's, we're very, very early in that phase. And I think that um, the, more, the more we can do to provide money as far as from, from the government perspective, the better, because it's a, you know, again, one in 10 people in the United States that are suffering from things like depression, that's really big, and it takes a huge toll on our, our economy. Right. So how could information technology actually help out with some of these challenges or address the challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the things, you know, we talked about managed care, and we talked about the psychologists and psychiatrists being forced to be seeing more and more and more patients. And so they're just like, they're just cramming in these people. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult because they can't really focus on one patient. And so what happens is in the way that they need to and should. And so what happens is um, they lose track. And they're not really given um, the tools to make good informed decisions on patient progress and how they should be working with the patient. And uh, essentially what happens is a patient will go in there and they'll see the doctor two weeks, you know, since the last visit. And then what will happen is they'll go back in like two weeks later and the patient will report on what's happened in the last day or two. They might be doing great in the last day or two, but the last week or so, they might have been suffering and in bed or had, you know, severe issues or whatever. Um, and so being able to provide that transparent information on how they're doing the entire course of the two weeks and we like to use analytics to do that, provide that information ahead of time before the, um, the patient goes in to meet with a clinician. It gives that transparent information and then the, what, ha what can happen is the, the uh, uh, psychologist and psychiatrist can really go in and focus on what's really important. Cut to the chase, you know, is it medication, is it adherence, is it sleep, is it diet, is it exercise and all that. And not only just also, I talked about medication, but we need to have a more holistic approach when it comes to patients. So, you know, is it, you know, talk therapy is an important thing. You know, social networks is an important thing, not just really focusing on drugs. It's, it's also, you know, you know, yoga, you know, all these various different things that might work for patients. And, um, you know, because I think what happens is we get into this mode of just throwing medications at patients and trying to see them get better in that respect and forgetting them you know, other aspects of their lives. And we're all, our human lives are very, very complex. We have various different social dynamics. We have, you know, um, lots of various different things that are, that are factoring into to our well-being as humans. Okay. Can you talk about the, a little bit about the importance of education regarding uh, mental illness? Yeah, and that's one thing that, that I'm actually a big proponent of. And I think it's really sad that um, people with mental illness get characterized in certain ways, like they're just crazy. Um, and what's been nice in the media and recently is, is wonderful people like Catherine Zeta-Jones has come out and said, I've got bipolar disorder. She has bipolar disorder too, which is more on the depressive side. Um, and it's great because it's someone that people know, they can identify with. And she's not crazy, you know, and, and, and it's, 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 it's really wonderful. And I really hope that there's more celebrities that are like that and people that, um, people can identify with that would come out and do this. And well, I think Van Gogh was one as well, right? Yeah, Van Gogh was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, people understand what he's done. They've seen his paintings and yeah, yeah. So I mean, and what's honest, honestly, a lot of these people that are, that have been diagnosed, they're just like you and me. And they're, they're, they're brilliant people and they've given a lot to society like Van Gogh. And then there's also wonderful organizations out there that are spreading the word and, and really helping people understand um, what mental illness is. So an example is uh, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. They really are focused on the families, helping the, the loved ones deal with 
um, people in their, you know, patients that are in the family's life that that are suffering from these various different affective disorders or, you know, mood disorders or whatever, and under helping them understand, you know, how do I work with that patient? How do I work with that loved one to, you know, provide them the best level of care and really understand what they're, where they're coming from? Um, and then also, you know, DBSA, Depression and, uh, Depression and Support Alliance, they uh, are out there. They're really focused on depression and uh, bipolar disorder, and they're helping, you know, really at the patient level and helping patients talk to patients and providing a community because that's a really important thing is for uh, people that are that are suffering to have a sense of uh, community and can be able to share stories and all that and then there's wonderful you know some of the pharmaceutical companies are wonderful one i went to an event um, it was a mental health conference in california and astrazeneca they had a really cool booth and it, it was it was like you could walk into this room and you could you put on these um on these headphones and you walked around and you saw images and you heard things and it was like putting yourself into the mind of someone with schizophrenia and it was really neat because you could actually see what it was like and and you know instead of thinking that someone is you know crazy or whatever you could actually see what it was you know how that person what they're dealing with and then they actually um, talked about um, you know how a um, an antipsychotic would actually help this person and how important that was. And so it's important then if you look at like um, what AstraZeneca did and, and some, of the, some of the medications that they developed, you can understand how important core research and clinical development is for these patients' lives. And you layer that in with social networks and, and people supporting you and, and, um, and education and um, just lifestyle changes and all that kind of stuff. And I think we have a good recipe for success. But I really think that at the government level, it needs to be taken seriously. And I know there's a lot of talk today about budget cuts and stuff like that, but this is somewhere that we cannot afford to, um, to not spend money on because it is the core. I mean, if we, if we are, you know, it's like health, wealth, and, and uh, happiness, right? If we don't have health, what do we have? And mental health is a is a very very important component of that. And people have like you know heart disease, they have um, diabetes and cancer and stuff like that. Mental health needs to be looked at as the same thing as like if you had heart disease and you had a heart attack or whatever, and you have high blood pressure or whatever. Um, and, and people really need to understand that. Um, and um, I think that you know companies like mine and some of those organizations that are out there really helping spread the word and, and we really hope that there's there's change. Great. Well that's a, a, a lot of good information for the viewers. Um, if they are interested in finding out more, where can they go? Again, I would probably send them over to uh, the DBSA site, to NAMI. Um, the Centers for Disease Control has some very good information on their site um, and I welcome them to check out our site which is McGrawSystems.com. Great. All right. Thanks for coming in today. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks Jeff. All right.